and thank you all for coming or listening in. So yes, the top. Oh yeah, thanks. Because yeah, much better, right? Yeah. Okay, so there's the title: improving, you know, uh, reconnaissance, scout reconnaissance using uh, pretty much drones. But let me. Um, but first off, I'm going to give some history, okay? I'm going to talk about a lot of those former research projects that kind of built upon each other and got me to here. And <clears throat> I'm pretty raspy today, so just bear with me, all right? Okay, so here's the list of all the research projects I've done since I came to Osprey. Now, it wasn't as soon as I got in the door. As soon as I got in the door, I was bugging the heck out of people. Right, but I didn't really get funding. I came in 93, so it took nine years or so. But I, I was pretty fortunate. I hit the big time in 2004, and it continues all the way on, well, to now. I don't have that one up here, but it, it was a combination. OSPER, SSCP, and then the agency formerly known as the U.S. Minerals Management Service. Okay. <clears throat> so I want to thank... <clears throat> The, uh, the scientific staff here, the, the people that ran the SSCP program, uh, Julie, uh, Randy Emai, who was my uh, supervisor, manager, colleague for uh, many years, uh, Tom, and the various um, administrators that we've had over the years who all supported me, okay? And all of these um, reports, the resulting reports are all available online, right? The OSPER ones are on our homepage. You just dive down into science. And the uh, MMS ones, you have to go to the Bessie homepage and look under their research or just type my name in and, and you'll, you'll see it. <laughs> okay, so just a little bit of high level science here. <clears throat> um, what we're dealing with the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum, um, this would be visible when our eyes see um, the, the projects I worked on. Um, we kind of went out into the infrared and then all the way out into the microwave radar. And the one I'll, I'm currently on, we're going to get down into the UV. So there's just another colorful look, right? This is what your eyes see. So we're going to dip into ultraviolet and uh, infrared. And I'll just mention radar. Okay, so I'm mentioning radar. Uh, <clears throat> the beauty of radar, or how radar works, I'll show the beauty in the next slide or so. Um, and this is a satellite or an aircraft, right? So it, uh, it sends out a burst of energy, which hits the surface, and it's, and it's either reflected totally away, or reflected totally back, or scattered, okay? It's all called backscatter, and it's that information, the timing of, of, of the energy return to the satellite is how the image is rendered. Now I can show you about the beauty of it. Okay, so this is the Golden Gate, all right? The bridge, solid, hard target. Um, I just proposed the shipping lanes, right? You can see some vessels here, here, and here. This is the Southeast Farallon Islands, and San Francisco, and the San Andreas Fault. I'm a geologist. <laughs> okay, this image was taken three hours later by an optical satellite, okay? So the beauty of radar is because of the wavelength, it sees right through fog, okay? Same place, three hours later. So one of the early SSEP projects was to evaluate radar on our own, okay? You know, when I was at, in graduate school, yes, I worked on the CSAT satellite, which was the first radar satellite ever launched into space. Um, it only lasted for one month, then it was a short circuit, but uh, in later years, um, the, uh, the, uh, what, the, urban, the urban legend came uh, about where, you know, this, that satellite was designed to measure ocean surface, right, o ocean features. Well, when on close examination of the imagery, uh, people started seeing wakes without a ship, and they put it together with the military and said, wait, those are our submarines and those are periscopes, okay? So, uh, you know, if we could see it, the Russians can see it, and they shut it right down. 
Okay. But fortunately for me, there was enough data collected that I was able to get my uh, master's degree out of it. <laughs> so what we did on our first radar project is uh, we collected 14 images over you know, a six week period in our high traffic areas. Okay, just to see what we could see. So we found we could easily identify those hard targets. These are platforms and ships. Okay. But there's a lot of other stuff that goes on in a radar, right? Let me back up a little bit. An oil film on the surface of the ocean will suppress all the little ripples and create a smooth surface. So you get that total reflection, right? So an oil slick on radar appears dark. But what's all this? Well, that's not oil. It could be uh, dead calm, uh, any number of uh, uh, natural phenomena that will suppress waves. However, if you look real carefully here, you see this linear feature, right, with that bright object at the end of it? Oh, that's a ship leaving California, leaving us a trail of something, okay? You can't say it's oil from the image, but you can say it's a film of something, okay? And then being a GIS person, I just kind of took that line and ran it right down. It goes right into the shipping lane, okay? Oh yeah, October, six o'clock, total darkness out there. Right? That's what our, it happens, right? Okay, another project that worked on using radar, uh, but it was high, high frequency radar. Uh, some of you know it as CODAR. Uh, CODAR gives us surface currents, okay? It's just a little antenna, broadcasts out, comes back. And, and I'll show examples of it. And we have uh, high frequency radar stations all along California. The state invested a lot of money a number of years ago, and it's 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 functioning, but it needs more funding. Uh, and you can see that data is now in Irma. I mean, my, when I did this, my whole thing was you got to make this information digestible to me and the general public because. Uh, the way the uh, high frequency radar was collected, it was collected and it was stored on some obscure website. You had to know where it was and you had to know what to do with it. And my whole thing was, I don't want to have to deal with that. Give me a GIS file out of it. And it took them a number of years, but, uh, and it wasn't no, it was the uh, Sencruz people who finally got it together. And now they, they, uh, uh, they have a, a, a map service that Noah picks up and uh, it goes right into Irma. Here's an example. Okay, so the, these vectors are uh, color coded by uh, uh, by strength and speed and direction. But I'm not going to dwell on all that. Okay, so I had this. We had this radar project. We go. Oh, this is great for a synoptic view of the ocean. We can see suspect oil, but we can't. We don't, we don't know if it's oil, yes or no. So that was my next project to develop a system or put together a system that can positively say yes, no oil. So we started out, uh, and all, all of my research in the remote sensing world was done uh, with ocean imaging, okay? They've been the principal investigator on, on all of my projects. And they had this nice uh, multi-spectral camera, which, you know, it's a big honkering thing, but we were able to make a fitting and stick it in our, in our part of the aircraft. Or an aircraft of opportunity. Uh, there it is on a helicopter. And that's, that's Dr. Stikovsky, by the way, who now lives on an island in Key West, Florida. <laughs> so, you know, when we started doing, I really apologize for my voice. <clears throat> we were able to detect, you know, uh, kelp, sediment, and other features that, that can suppress surface waves, okay? Uh, the only problem we really had was sun glint. And that's just the reflection of the sun off the ocean. When we started really breaking it down and looking at the different wavelengths within that, these slits took on different appearances, right? So we, you know, took a big leap and said, ah, maybe it's related to thickness, right? And that was the 64, I was going to say $64, but $64 million question, you know, that needed to be answered. Um, where is actionable oil versus non? 
So that's pretty much when the federal government jumped in, gave us a lot of funding, okay? And we went out to OMSET. This is the OMSET thing <coughs> here. We set up our little system, put oil on the, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen OMSET. It's, it's essentially a swimming pool, like two football fields long, okay? Uh, and with a wave machine back here. And there's, uh, we're right on the uh, Atlantic Ocean. There's, they're bringing in seawater. It's in New Jersey. So we built these little targets, filled them up with known amount of oil, you know, a known thickness, and then did our imaging. Okay. <laughs> then we had our first chance to use, use this system, right? We weren't using it. It was still experimental. Um, so it wasn't used for any decision making, but it was a, a beautiful opportunity to see what we could see. So this is a typical uh, NOAA overplay map. I know you can't see what it's what it what it's showing, but it, you know they're, they're they're sketching and making comments, tar balls, sheen, that kind of stuff. It, it's um, it's not bad. It's good information, but we can do better. Don't let me say that to Noah. <laughs> Already. <laughs> okay, so I just want to zoom in on this area here, Angel Island. Okay, so this is, this is the multi-spectral camera uh, at this time. All right, so here's a little blow up from here. So the red is, act is what we were considering actionable oil, with a, a thickness enough to be uh, skimmable. Okay, and, uh, and the blue area is uh, sheen. And if you look here, this is MSRC doing their thing. And I, I'm, they're doing a fine job. It's just, that's not where all the oil was. And uh, I mean, uh, to, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, from the surface of a ship, it's almost impossible to see where the oil is. They have spotter helicopters that only go up about 500 feet. Um, we were flying at 12,000 feet here. So we get the big picture. And here's the, the zoom in on, on Angel Island. Okay, and those are the MSRC vessels over here. Okay, so how, how did Osprey use this? Uh, our NRDA people were very interested, right? So we have kelp beds or eelgrass, eelgrass beds, right? So we're able to take the, the, the GIS layer and overlay it with the remote sensing data, okay? And I, I, I'm really not sure what came out of that, but it, it was useful at the time, I guess. So that was our thing, mapping spills better and faster, right? And I'm just gonna skip through all this stuff because I am having trouble speaking here. You can read it if you like, I'll click slowly. The main thing is that it's, uh, it's not a subjective view, right? The computer and the system, it's all objective. It just measures what's there. Um, we're not depending on a spotter or even NOAA-trained observers. If you put two of them up there, they're going to be slightly different because our eyes are different, you know, our brains are different, whatever. Right, and, and my, always, my thing always is that we need this. Whatever we create, whatever data we collect, it's got to be in a GIS format. Otherwise, I don't want it, right? Because I don't have to sit there and figure out how manipulated to get it into the GIS. I want the contractor or whatever, or the system to do that for me. That's my selfishness. All right, so there's some pictures from the tech. Oh, okay. I know why I stuck this in here. Uh, this is thermal imagery. Okay, so along uh, our next step was to add another camera. Right? So we added, here it is. We added a thermal camera, All right? So this is our original four-channel multispectral, and we had another uh, thermal. Okay, so we had an opportunity to use that uh, in 2008. Platform A had a spill. It was uh, produced fluids or something they called it, and uh, it, it was. There's a lot of things that were neat about this. Um, First of all, the estimate of what was released, right? It was a, a figure like this, okay? Well, we flew it and just taking the most minimal thickness that we could come up with and the area, it was more than twice as much as this much, okay? So, you know, always take that estimate as an estimate with a big green of salt. But what was neat about this is uh, these are those CODAR vectors, the high frequency uh, radar. 
And um, it was a very calm day. So the oil was just kind of sitting there and floating along. This outline here was where uh, was the initial response. Uh, it was, I think, Chris Graff in, in, an, in a um, uh, fishing game plane just flying around, right? And this was like three hours later, and you can see it just drifted, but following these uh, high frequency radar contours. So this is actually a very valuable tool, the, the vectors besides the remote sensing. So um, I guess the way we use this is we kept flying until we couldn't see anything else. And then we see anything, you know, more recoverable oil, that's it, uh, end of uh, uh, offshore operations. Um, here's a field picture. This is from platform A. You can see they're doing their, their, their skimming thing. All right. And here's some uh, remote sensing imagery that we collected. That. So this is the multispectral, and this is the thermal. So the multispectral is really uh, good for seeing sheen, okay? The thermal is really good for thick oil, right? So we, we kind of gave up on uh, saying, oh, it's 0.5 millimeter or 0.006 millimeter. I think we just got to the point where we just want to know actionable, non-actionable. That's what people wanted to know in a, during the response. They didn't care the thickness or all. And we can get that after the fact. So here's, here's uh, some skimming going on, and there they are right there, right around the, the thick oil. Okay, then uh, when the water horizon uh, happened, that big blowout in the Gulf of Mexico that you've all heard about, right? So NOAA invited uh, us to go down there and use the system. And it was flown daily, sometimes twice daily from uh, uh, it was there in the beginning of May till it was shut off in uh, in July. And again, everything is a GIS product from, from as far as I'm concerned. So this is Irma. It's actually the Gulf of Mexico Irma, and there's some of our data just right in. And some more stuff we did there. And more stuff we did there. And more stuff we did there. Uh, what I'm showing here, this is, you know, uh, I don't know if you know the Gulf Coast, but it's not a coastline. It's not a solid coastline like we have in California. They have hundreds, maybe thousands of islands that come and go. So um, that was my first problem. To, oh, I need a shoreline. Well, there was no shoreline. Okay. But anyway, uh, what I'm showing here is oil they train in these, uh, I, I don't know what the vegetation is, so you people can tell me. But, and then here it is in the thermal. And I'll show you the vegetation. And there's our picture. So this is what it actually looked like. Okay, this, this is the same day. Same day, same place. I was in a good position. I was able to coordinate uh, SCAT with remote sensing missions. I, Bruce, you were there. You may remember that, yeah. I, I had a lot of fun in the Gulf of Mexico. I, I was working for the planning chief, and uh, he had me evaluating all the remote sensing data that was being collected. So there's all kinds of speculative, you know, speculative uh, data that people were collecting, and I would. Uh, he had me look at it, and it was like, oh, this is really cool, but it's an academic experiment. This is good, you know, that kind of thing. And I was loving life there. Some more shoreline pictures. So, who knows what this is? Because I don't know. Some kind of grass. <coughs> okay. Okay, so when we were done with this, those multitudes of projects, uh, ocean imaging themselves took it further, compressed it down, put it in a nice handy package, and they now uh, lease it to uh, MSRC. So one of these sensors is on each coast, Atlantic, Pacific, and Gulf. So if we have a spill here in California, MSRC uh, can do the survey for us. However, they have a different, uh, 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 they do it to direct their assets, right? They go for the actionable, non-actionable. If we want transects, um, we have the ability to call ocean imaging directly and they'll bring another system out here. Um, you know, they have an exclusive contract with MSRC, but since it was developed with OSPR, um, we're like the only ones that can call them directly. Otherwise you have to go through uh, MSRC. And, oh, 
So one of the things I did, and I'm deviating here, is I put together this uh, decision matrix for our field people. Um, what remote sy sensing systems are appropriate for the various types of spill we have here? So, right, a small spill in a, in a small arena, uh, marina, you don't really need remote sensing. Uh, you know, something in, uh, like Costco, Passan, you got to follow the colored arrows here. Um, talking about the, the HF radar, get those current vectors, right? Then the ocean imaging system, and fly it daily, right? And Refugio, follow it, radar, then consider bringing in other assets. The Canadians have this uh, beautiful aircraft that has radar in it. So it's not satellite, but it's airborne. And, uh, and with airborne, you can go anywhere you want. Satellite, you're at the mercy of where it is, right? Aircraft are going down. And then a big, uh, sorry, a big blowout. Uh, you know, that's where we go to the satellites. And on the back side of that, I just have all the uh, info where you get that stuff. So I went around to all the FRTs and I, I gave this out to them. And uh, it's probably uh, in a folder somewhere in their drawers. Okay, I think I brought us up to where my title was. Um, again, I'm working with Ocean Imaging. Um, we have outside interest, Exxon. Um, I, I spoke with them in our last technology workshop and uh, um, they kind of got excited and contributed some money to the project, which I greatly appreciated because we were a little short on cash. Uh, MSOC is interested for their own selfish reasons because they want to you know, market it and sell it. And, and uh, we've got a subcontractor on, on this project who is right now assembling this drone. So we don't have it here yet, the system I'm working on. And let me show you what I'm talking about. Okay. So the system I'm working on now, multispectral and thermal, just like the, the, the original system. But I'm adding an ultraviolet camera, right? And here's why. Uh, on the oil on water, there's always going to be a temperature differential, either warmer or colder. This is, you know, a real short time where uh, they're in equilibrium. And we, we did that. We did testing at offset. We stayed there, you know, in well into the night, and, you know, we saw. But oil has, uh, um, it, it emits ultraviolet uh, fluorescence, right? On shore, and I'll show examples, there's all kinds of... Uh, reasons for things to be warm, uh, black soil, you know, mussels uh, on the shoreline. Uh, you'll see inland there's a glare from the sun, but this should be able to tell us oil, yes, no. I hope. I can see those fingers there. Otherwise, Tom wasted a lot of money. <laughs> Ooh, what did I do? How did that get there? Uh, okay, so this, this uh, it's currently in Florida being assembled, okay, thermal, multispectral, ultraviolet. It's a much larger drone, probably, uh, you know, two and a half feet uh, around. Some problems, or the, the initial problem, having them trigger simultaneous, right? have them sighting the same area, you know, not all over the place, right? They all have different footprints, so I'm kind of aiming for a center point. And this is the very first imagery I have from the uh, UV camera. Um, the white areas are uh, oil with water entrainment, not quite emulsion, but this, this is just like an oil, you know, when you change your oil, put some oil pan out in the sunlight, they just put in uh, motor oil and water and kind of mixed it up. And, and so, you know, so far, so good. <laughs> it works in the parking lot. Okay, but right, wait, I got to take some of this to here. But I had an opportunity this past summer to go down to uh, the Simric oil field out about 30 miles uh, west of Bakersfield where they had a tremendous blowout. They call them surface expressions. They're really subsurface blowouts, uncontrolled flow of oil to the surface. Um, so I, I was able to purchase, when we had that year-end money, a, uh, 
a little a little a uh, little drone that has both a HD camera and a lower resolution thermal camera. So I just took it down there. Just what am I going to see? Um, I flew this at solar noon just to avoid shadows and to make sure the oil was as hot as it can be. And no surprises, oil. You know, not oil. See this? These are craters too, older craters. You can see the staining. Oh, there you go. Right. Yeah. However, <laughs> however, if you look, okay, you know, uh, my mapping mission is just flying transects. Okay, so in that first set of images, uh, the sun was being reflected away. Here, all of a sudden, the sun is being reflected right up into the drone, right? Here's the oil there, but what happened here? I mean, there's no oil there, but you have this very light tan super reflector, okay? So that's why I want to add the, therm uh, the ultraviolet camera, okay? Because thermal, is it, it's not foolproof. Again, um, no, no oil, yet super bright. However, going the other direction, same place, just flipped around. Now it's nice and calm. And what you see here, these bright spots, uh, these are their steam pipes. You know, it's a cyclic steam injection, and they're insulated except for here, you know, where their valves are. That's what you're seeing there. Now it's, it's neat. This, this drone was like designed for uh, people inspecting uh, roofs and stuff like that. Where's the heat loss? So the camera, then the newer camera, right, this, this whole drone costs $3,500. That thermal camera for the research drone was $14,000. Okay, so hopefully it's going to be a big difference, not just in price. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Um, this is for overall, uh, you know, situational awareness. I uh, flew these transit well, actually they were this way. And this is a mosaic created from about six or 700 images. Okay, so I was flying with 75% overlap, uh, all sides. And uh, to process the data, and I might have a slide that says this, but um, the data is pretty much available immediately because it's just an SD card. You can stick that right in your computer. But to use a, a drone to map is the software I've been using uh, to get this mosaic. Uh, a, a quick look or a low resolution took about two hours. And to get the high resolution image, full resolution, that was a 10 hour processing job. Okay. That was an overnight thing. And I didn't charge my time for all of that processing. <laughs> okay. And then with that drone to map software, you can also do this 3D rendering which is, I think, totally cool. Uh, these color contours are about 10 meters of elevation. So I, I think we were flying from up here. And uh, our flight elevation was 125 feet above here. So it's more like 200 feet above uh, the channel. Now, this is much later in time. The oil has already been cleaned up. But you can see you know, the, the temporary dikes they put in, the permanent berm, stuff like that. I thought, I thought it was cool. However, the environmental unit, I mean, that was just me doing my mapping thing, right? Environmental unit was using uh, drones to inspect these things, all the little burrows, right? All these little rat holes or whatever they are. Uh, and they were actually uh, uh, Diana Grosso and Roy Kim were the two pilots doing that. And Roy, my main man, he was ready to just, he just flew right in. He scared me, okay? <laughs> I mean, there was dust welling up and everything, but he got right in there. And these are abandoned. But, you know, this, was, this is the slope leading down to the, to the street. So, right, there were health and safety restrictions. There was no way we could go on the slopes or down into it. So the drones, just, it's just perfect. Okay, and I just, now I'm just showing fun stuff. Uh, how do I do this now? Ah, yeah. So, see that? That's the last surface expression. Uh, there, were, there were like six or seven in this area leading into this channel. So that's oil, mud, steam, and probably methane coming out of there. 
Yeah, that was pretty far. That's the drone doing it. I, we were safely up on the hillside. That it? Okay. I think I've got one more. No. There. This one. Okay, this was Roy flying. And he just got right down in there looking for wildlife. What got stuck in there? These are dragonflies. I, you know, I mean, they're bugs, but we do care, sort of. This is a pump that Chevron had installed. By the way, they were pumping this oil out of right out of this stream bed into a tank truck and taking it right to the refinery and selling it. Yes. So uh, yeah, it was bad, bad, but they were getting money out of this. Okay, it's like Jed Clampett. Remember, oil bubbling out. No labor. They did get fined. Dyke Dogger, two point seven million. You know, that's this to Chevron. Come on. <laughs> so this is that uh, uh, surface expression I showed earlier. So this is uh, several weeks later. Everything's kind of calmed down. They're, they're cleaning up the other end. It's draining. Yeah, I asked Roy to go in there and give us a good look. Yeah, so this is a uh, drilling fluids. Bent night mud is what they, they use. And the story is they were abandoning a well up on the hillside, and uh, and when they pressured and they pressured it and started putting fluids down, about 400 yards away, these expressions started popping up. Uh, one of them, which is up here, and we're going to go to it, is 22 by 18 feet. You can take a pickup truck, stick it right in there. That's pretty impressive. So I had a lot of fun at Deepwater Horizon, but this was more exciting to me, OK? <laughs> See the bathtub green? They've already uh, drained it down, and we're down to the mud and whatever. So what they did is they came in with an excavator, right? And they put in a, a coagulant. It's kind of like the stuff in baby diapers uh, or, or adult diapers. Uh, you know, it absorbs fluids, right? And they mixed it up. Thick enough that they could scoop it out, put it in a truck, and haul it off to a dump. So the big craters up here is just a little side thing. Here we go. Little, little baby crater here. 2218. And I said, Roy, get in there. <laughs> I have another one that I'm not showing where he actually went right in. This one, he just kind of hovering over the surface. But, you know, uh, dragonflies, um, wildlife, they were like uh, owls, I think, and uh, there's the uh, reflection of the drone. Oh, cool. Just a little thing. So, this is one on my desk if you want. So, SCAT reconnaissance, right? Resources at risk, situational awareness, all, all, all doable remotely. I mean, it doesn't replace walking, but we couldn't. There's that excavator. That's where they were mixing this stuff up. This is probably the stuff they poured on top of it. It's a big excavator. I've never seen one that large. Long reach, they call it. And I think the flight ends because uh, going around the bend, we were beyond our uh, visual uh, contact and you, you you can't go over 400 feet and you can't go beyond your visual line of sight those are basic rules for drone flying that's your tom <laughs> you can't fly my that's cool <laughs> you can't fly over people either <laughs> i think that's done there yep there i'm through Oh, that's just that, that it was really active when I first got down there. That's just a telephoto picture of it. Yeah, yeah Mike. How is it getting approval to fly the drones? Okay, well, uh, Mr. Steve Goldman is on the line here, and we filed paperwork with the department. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, and Steve is the department's GI, uh, not G he is the, the GIS manager. He's also the drone program manager, mm -hmm. and uh, we filed paperwork, and and Steve approved it, and then I think we had to refile it because it was good for 30, 30 days. So, um, yeah, there's paperwork and procedures beforehand. Now, Steve will expedite things for us for emergency response. Okay. But yes, we have. Uh, are, these, are these department requirements? Because they're not FAA requirements. You can't. Uh, these that. are department requirements, okay. right? FAA only requires the Part 107 license. Uh, the department, we have further, further uh, requirements. Okay, you know, liability, we're public agency, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So our, our, this is Steve Goldman. Our requirements go above and beyond the FAA requirements. Yes, Bruce. Especially in these remote areas, how precise and how reliable is the GPS data that you need to have accurate track lines and do these um, cool mosaics? Very. I mean, exactly uh, GPS is coming from satellites. Yeah. So, so you unless you got a uh, you know cover, which you won't because you're not flying then, yeah. or a cliff face, uh, yeah, excellent. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Good. Much better in cell phone coverage. <laughs> yeah. So, Joe. Hi. How high up was the uh, drone when Roy was flying the drone? Oh, he was so just <laughs> maybe four feet or less. Oh, wow. or, or, he was just cruising around along the surface. Wow. Yes. Roy's my man. Excellent <laughs> pilot. <laughs> it's that millennial thing. You know, he can just sit there and, you know, me, I, I got to look at it. He's fixed on the, on the tablet. And I, as, as Steve did mention, that I will. Um, not only must you be a qualified pilot, but you have to have a qualified visual observer with you. Okay, so there's a four hour visual observer class. Uh, okay, and that's our department requirements must be a pilot in command and a visual observer. Bruce. What's the plan maiden voyage of this contraption is being assembled in Florida? Okay, it's being assembled in Florida. Then it's going up to Colorado to Ocean Imaging uh, to their headquarters. They're going to do the initial test flights. Then it's coming out to California. And my plan is to go back down to Kern County. Um, and I, I, if I can get into that Simmerick field, great. But if I can't, there are natural seeps outside of that field. There was actually the McKittrick tar pits. Who knew? Yeah. And there, there's, there's, uh, when I was there, well, I, should, I, I have pictures. That, that will be my test bed for inland. Then I want to go uh, probably in the spring or summer to Refugio and fly along there. Because the whole purpose of this project is to go from the shoreline upstream. Right? We've got the ocean covered. And we have a spill in the ocean. We're going to use the ocean imaging system. There's no need to get drones out there. Uh, uh, you know. Our needs are inland now, so that's that's the plan. Yeah. Is it capable of picking up submerged and sunken oil as well? Or <sighs> nah, we're just at the surface right now. You know, I don't think I'm not thinking about that. Oh, but yeah. uh, you know, you need a submerged, but you got to go down. Uh, uh, Coast Guard has done stuff with sonar and things like that. Right. Yeah, I guess this is more like. That's something else I thought about with a, you know, a higher resolution thermal camera. Can we do bird counts and things like that? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, I, um, uh, Laird and I have been talking about uh, starting with maybe sea otters. Uh, and then I thought, oh, all that insulation, we won't see anything. But he assured me there is a temperature difference between their fur and the ocean. So yes, they're NRDA or, um, you know, uh, uh, wildlife ops, sure. You know, we just got to get rolling here. You know? What kind of flight times do you get carrying that payload? Good. With three different sensors. Um, well, hopefully 25 minutes. Okay, it's it's a larger drone with more batteries, but still, uh, all those cameras, uh, you know, it sucks energy, and also the uh, conditions. If it's a wind, if it's windy, you know, then the drone's constantly adjusting, and that burns up uh, energy too. So, uh, like that mosaic that I did, 
that was a three battery flight sometimes. Okay, so it, I'd have to pause. It, it would return, change the battery, and then the smart the software is smart enough that it goes right back to where it was and continues. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Judd, for the presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>